In today's video, we're going to tell you the full story behind none other than the de facto leader of the boys, Billy Butcher. There are full spoilers ahead. Womp womp. Before Butcher. Many of the characters in the boys are parodies of some of the most recognized heroes in comics. Even Billy Butcher himself is based off a classic Marvel character too, the Punisher. Billy's story starts in the East End of London. His full name is William Butcher and he grew up with his mom Carol, his dad Samuel, and his younger brother named Lenny. In a nutshell, you can say that Billy came from a hard-nosed, blue-collar background, and if you didn't know by now, the man that would one day be simply coined as the Butcher is a hard, hard man. Perfectly fitting when you consider that Billy had a rough upbringing right from the get-go. You see, his dad was, to sum up in one word, a bit of a monster. The old man had a thing for beating his wife and sons day in and day out, and this molded Billy into becoming a violent kid. So much so that he got expelled from school for trying to emulate his father's behavior. Not to mention too that Billy developed a justified deep-seated hatred for his father. But hey, one good thing that came out of all of this is that Billy became close with his younger brother, Lenny, and their mom. Like most things, Billy reached a boiling point one day when he decided to do something about his father's horrid behavior. That is to say, the young butcher planned to snuff out his dad. It was only through Lenny's intervention that Billy was able to think things through and not go ahead with it. So instead, Billy left home. He just couldn't stand being under the same roof as their father. And from there, he decided to join the Royal Marines, where he discovered that, well, he had a talent for violence. Billy made a name for himself in the campaign as an extremely efficient killer to say the least, and for a time, it would seem that Butcher had found his place in the world. But old habits die hard. The twisted values he acquired growing up, all thanks to his father, caught up with him while in the Marines. He might have been a super effective man of war, but Butcher's got some hardcore authority issues that manifested in insubordination and random bar fights that he got into. This ultimately led to him being discharged from the Marines and going back home to Lenny and his mom, presumably presumably living off the pension he got from his time in the military. Suffice it to say that Butcher had become a layabout at this point in his life, spending most of his days getting blackout drunk. And when he's not getting hammered, you know he's getting into fights. For a while, Billy's life revolved around these two things after his expulsion from the Marines. That is, until Billy meets the love of his life. While riding the subway one day, a woman named Becky Saunders approached Billy and struck up conversation with him. The two hit it off and Billy, well, he was instantly head over heels for this woman. Woman. Soon enough, Billy and Becky would go on a couple of dates. He'd spill his guts to her about everything, from his time in the Marines down to his rough childhood. They'd eventually become a couple too. Heck, Billy was even instrumental in convincing Billy and Lenny's mom to leave her husband for good. And ultimately, Billy and Becky got married. We cannot overstate this enough that Becky was pretty much the most important thing in Billy's life. She's the MJ to his Peter, the Lois to his Clark. It would seem everything was coming up butcher at this point in his life, but true to the style Stylings of Garth Ennis, tragedy is always just around the corner. The birth of the butcher. Billy would experience the first two events that would ultimately transform him into the person that he is within the pages of the boys when Lenny was killed in a bus accident. It's a freakish heartbreaking event, but still, Billy soldiered on and chose to continue living his life in spite of the great loss. And even though he's lost one of the closest people he's had in his life, he still had Becky, but little did he know that she wouldn't be staying for long. Because eventually, Billy and Becky would find themselves vacationing in Miami. And this is the place where we can say that the butcher that we see within the pages of the boys was officially born. It all started when Billy noticed that Becky was acting rather distant while on their way home from Miami. At the time, he didn't know that something world shatteringly bad happened to his wife, specifically that a VOD American owned superhero had assaulted her. In fact, Billy would only get a clue about what happened to his wife when Becky died in the most agonizing fashion three months after they got home from their Florida vacation. It was during one night in bed while Billy and Becky were asleep. Suddenly, Mrs. Butcher started to writhe in pain, and after a few seconds, a superpowered infant was born. Becky didn't survive the birth, and Billy, in his horror, didn't even have time to think and ended up eliminating what was in front of him. And that is how Billy Butcher lost everything. Billy's vengeful road. Obviously devastated with the death of his wife, Billy would lash out at local authorities when they tried to bring him in for questioning and insinuate that they should cover up the whole incident given that Vought American, the mega corporation 
corporation that owns nearly all the superheroes in the world was involved. After that, a man named Greg Mallory would approach Billy and hand him a diary that Becky had secretly written. In it, Billy would find out the details behind what truly happened in Miami, that it was the superhero Homelander who forced himself upon her, and that the only reason she kept it a secret from Billy was to prevent him from actively seeking out revenge. Billy was way beyond getting payback at this point. He was on a road to destruction. As for Mallory, well, he had his own agenda. The reason he approached Butcher was to draft him into a secret government sanctioned operation that would help him get his revenge on Homelander. It would take years, but Mallory assured him that he was going to get what he wants by the end of his newfound partnership. And so Billy Butcher accepted the offer. His first mission was to eliminate a group of superhuman individuals living inside a cabin somewhere in America, which Butcher gladly and successfully accomplished with the help of his military background. Over the years, Butcher and Mallory would carry out these sorts of missions all in the name of keeping America's so-called superheroes in check. Along the way, they would also add more members to their ranks, such as Mother's Milk, the female, and the Frenchman. And at this point, where Butcher came up with the name for their secret crew, the boys. In fact, Butcher and the boys became so efficient at eliminating superheroes that they gained a reputation for being the boogeyman of America's caped community. Eventually, the boys would go on an extended hiatus after a few successful years of superhero eliminations. The present. And now we've caught you up to the start of the original comic book run of the boys taking place sometime in the early 2000s. We see Billy Butcher with the very first issue of the boys comic as he sits on a park bench together with his trusty four-legged sidekick terror now before we proceed we want to tell you guys to keep an eye out on terror because one he's one of the goodest boys and two he's pretty much the only thing keeping whatever remains of billy butcher's psyche intact but more on that later anyway they watch superheroes fly across the sky before getting off their seats and paying a visit to cia director susan rayner uh well let's just say close colleague of billy rayner informs billy that the cia CIA had kickstarted a new initiative to keep Vought American superhero community in check by whatever means necessary. The director then briefs him that this is as top secret as it goes. The CIA will take no responsibility for the operation. Hearing this, Butcher proposes to bring his old team, the boys, back together. Rayner agrees, and not long after that, Butcher brings his old team back with the Frenchman, the female, and Mother's Milk. Somewhere else, a random Scottish guy named Huey Campbell had lost his girlfriend after a superhero named A Train who also happens to be a member of America's number one superhero team, The Seven, ran her over with his super speed. Curiously, Butcher would then pay the grieving Huey a visit to entice him into joining his team shortly after his girlfriend's death. Much like how Mallory convinced him all those years ago, Butcher tells Huey about the details behind his late lover's death, from the identity of the superhero who ran through her, right up to how Huey can get his revenge with the help of Butcher and his operation. So, unsurprisingly enough, the young man joins him. A bit later, Butcher and the boys, together with their new recruit, Huey, meet inside their hideout to discuss their first mission to take out a superhero team called Teenage Kicks. It's a group made of a younger Vought American-owned superheroes, and Butcher even tells Huey that A-Train, the same guy who killed his girlfriend, started his career on this team. So they proceed with their first mission. First, they keep tabs on the superhero team as they go about their business away from the public's eye. Butcher and the boys take photos and videos of these events to use as dirt against them, which is basically their crew's main strategy. However, the mission gets a bit rocky when Butcher injects Huey with a drug called Compound V without his consent, the same substance that gives Vought superheroes their powers. This makes Huey furious in spite of the fact that Butcher explains to him that he did it as a safety measure in case they got into an altercation with their superpowered targets. And just for some context, Butcher reveals that there's a variety of Compound V concoctions in their world. The purest form of the drug would give anyone who took it permanent superpowers. Meanwhile, the one he used on Huey was a diluted version of Compound V, which basically makes a person temporarily more physically durable and strong. In any case, Huey and Butcher would make up the next day and proceed with the next phase of their mission, blackmailing Teenage Kicks. To do this, they used the incriminating photos they gathered from their stakeout to force the superhero team into sacrificing one of their members to discredit himself in the media. It worked as planned too. Now remember Homelander? The guy who Butcher believes was responsible for the death of his wife, Beth. Yeah, he's pretty much the Superman of this world, the most famous superhero in America, and the leader of the Seven, the boys' version of the Justice League. Well, he sees the news of one of the Teenage Kicks members publicly smearing himself, and Homelander immediately realizes that the boys are back. Because if you can recall, Butcher and his crew are already infamous within superhero.
superhero circles at this point, it's just that Homelander thought that they were still on hiatus. After the whole media circus with one of the Teenage Kicks members, the rest of their team then decided to confront Butcher and the boys, knowing that they were the ones who blackmailed them. A huge fight ensues where Butcher and his crew absolutely flatline each and every member of the Teenage Superhero team. In the aftermath of the mission, Huey speaks with Butcher and contemplates quitting the boys right then and there, but Billy manages to reel him back in when he tells Huey about Becky's story. Right after that, they go back to their hideout and Butcher declares to go scorched earth on every superhero they find. Butcher gets some payback. Sometime later, Butcher would take Huey to a comic book store. There, he explains that comics are basically propaganda material that Vought uses to sell their superhero IPs to the world. To put it simply, Vought crafts these fictional origin stories and adventures for their superhero properties to put them in the best light. This is, of course, allowing the company to cover the truth behind what their superheroes do behind the scenes and, of course, gain some of that sweet, sweet revenue for Vought American. But this wasn't just an educational trip for Butcher and Huey. That's because it turns out that the comic book store is owned by a man simply known as The Legend. He's a comic book mogul who has deep ties with Vought's superhero community, meaning that he knows all the dirt on the company and its properties. Oh yeah, and The Legend is actually one of the boy's closest informants and allies. Now the whole reason that Butcher and Huey are here is because The Legend wants them to look into a cold case concerning the murder of a young man from about a half a year ago. The police have already given up on it, but The Legend thinks that a superhero named Swing Wing was the one responsible for the crime. So Butcher and Huey do some investigating. First, they drop by a bar that the victim used to frequent. There, they find out that Swing Wing is pretty much an LGBTQ plus icon in the superhero community. Now, the victim, whose name was Steven, is what you might call a groupie. However, the bar's patrons and barkeep immediately tell Butcher and Huey that Swing Wing didn't have much time to mingle with Steven and the other people at the establishment, considering that Swing Wing was always busy with his superhero work. So Butcher then decides to move their investigation and pay Swing Wing's old boss a visit, a superhero named Tech Knight. Tech Knight is a parody of Batman and Iron Man, and he's been around in the boys' universe for a long, long time. He's mostly evaded the boys' crosshairs, considering that even Butcher thinks Tech Knight is a pretty vanilla superhero. In any case, Butcher and Huey arrive at Tech Knight's manor, and the superhero welcomes them inside his lair. There, Butcher reveals that he knows about Tech Knight's behind-the-scenes activities, even though he didn't actively seek out dirt on the man in the past. Butcher tries to grill Tech Knight about Swing Wing's whereabouts, but the superhero didn't give him anything. Sometime later, news broke that outed Tech Knight's proclivities to the media. Butcher figures out that this would be the best time to pressure the superhero into giving them answers, not to mention that Butcher knows that Tech Knight is one of the rare superheroes around who doesn't have legit superpowers from Compound V. He's just a guy in a really advanced suit. So Butcher and the boys head over to Tech Knight's manor. Not long after that, Butcher and the boys would finally locate Swing Wing's hideout. We discover that Swing Wing, like Tech Knight, is just another guy in a mech suit without Compound V derived powers. A fight breaks out between Butcher, Huey, and Swing Wing. The boys overpower the superhero, and they finally get the answers they've been looking for. It turns out Swing Wing accidentally killed Steven by pushing him off a roof half a year ago. By the end of his confession, Butcher decides to let him go instead of executing him. In exchange, the superhero will now serve as an informant for the boys. Butcher in Russia Butcher would then take his crew to Russia for their next mission in order to investigate a slew of murders concerning people's heads suddenly exploding. They meet with ex-superhero and friend Voss, aka Love Sausage, while in Russia. Afterwards, Butcher and the boys discover that one of the victims who got their head popped used to belong to a Russian crime syndicate. Butcher and the boys then find out about a notorious mafia boss named Little Nina after she sent them a couple of hitmen to deal with them. They discover that Nina is attending a meeting with someone from Vought American. Butcher would then track Little Nina inside her hideout. There, he sees more than 100 Russian superheroes gathered in one place. Unbeknownst to him, Little Nina is actually planning on using these superheroes to stage a coup against the Russian government. They also managed to grab a picture of the Vought American representative that Nita met with, and we find out it's James Stilwell, the same guy who handles Homelander and the Seven. Butcher is able to realize what little Nina is planning with Vought American. He would pressure a couple of Vought employees working with Stilwell to spill the beans, and he'd even successfully grab a detonator meant to kill the Russian superheroes while he was at it. Later, Butcher finally pieces Vought American and little Nina's plans. He correctly surmises that it was Stilwell who hired little Nina to send a couple of her assassins to deal with them earlier. More importantly, little Nina plans on using the Russian superheroes she's gathered in the past few months as pawns. She plans on letting them loose to go on a fake coup against the government and then use the detonator to eliminate them all, which would then paint her as a hero of the people. Ultimately, this would 
allow little Nina to become Russia's prime minister. But here's the thing, as Butcher is able to surmise, Vought American is actually planning on double-crossing little Nina. She thinks that Vought handed her the detonator that will eliminate the Russian superheroes, but it's actually a fake. That's because in truth, Vought is planning on installing their very own prime minister in Russia, someone that the company can control. But after all these revelations, Butcher and the rest of the boys get knocked out when they discover that little Nina managed to poison the borscht that they were eating at Love Sausage's bar. Only Love Sausage and Huey manage to stay conscious as little Nina's henchmen attack them. In the end, they fend off the goons and even bear witness to little Nina's death before she can spring her planned coup. Sometime later, Butcher and the rest of the team recover from the poisoned borscht. He then manages to suss out Vought's ultimate plan in Russia to start another cold war and force the American government to use the company as their main weapons contractor. And by weapons, we mean Vought was planning on producing more superheroes for the American government if their plans in Russia came to fruition. After that, Butcher discovers that Rayner and the rest of the CIA aren't planning on calling out Vought for this failed conspiracy. According to her, the company might sick their superhuman assets on the government and the US is not ready for a war against superheroes just yet. In the end, Butcher goes for a consolation prize. He pays the Russian superheroes a visit and uses the detonator he stole to eliminate them all. After that, it's back to America. Butcher, back in the US. After another late night visit between Rayner and Butcher, he expresses his disappointment in Rayner's refusal to expose Vought American about what they discovered in Russia. And this is when the CIA director explains just how deep Vought's influence goes. They don't just own superheroes, they've got deep connections in the government too. So trying to go after Vought right now will just end up with Rayner and the CIA running in circles. Not long after, Butcher would discover that Vought American is planning on worming their way into the White House as well. While snooping on the Seven, he hears Homelander mention the company's plans to position Vic the Veep to become the next president of the United States. At this point, Vic the Veep is set to deliver a pro Vought and pro superhero production speech to the public. So to foil this plan, Butcher and the boys bring this matter to Dakota Bob, the current president of the country and a staunch anti-superhero figure in US politics. Dakota Bob then banned Vic the Veep from conducting his speech and news of this eventually reached Homelander and James Stilwell. Homelander knows that Butcher and the boys are behind this and suffice it to say that this Superman ripoff is ticked off, especially considering that they have a truce in place. We'll cover that soon enough, but all you need to know right now is the reason for the initial hiatus that the boys took prior to the start of this series was because of the ceasefire between Vought and the boys. So Homelander sends one of the seven, the aquatic hero called the Deep, to set up a meeting with Butcher and the boys to talk about what's happening with this truce of theirs. Butcher agrees to the meeting and soon enough he and Homelander come face to face. The leader of the Seven asks Butcher why the boys are making moves in breach of their ceasefire, and more specifically, exactly why Butcher seems to have it out for Homelander. Now we all know at this point about Butcher's motivations for doing everything that he does, but curiously enough, Homelander has no idea. During this meeting, the star-spangled superhero can only guess that he must have done something to someone Butcher cares about. Homelander even uses his powers to check on Butcher's heartbeat, and this helps him correctly surmise that the man's crusade against Vought is related to something personal. But their meeting is cut short when their best boy Terra gives Homelander's leg a well-deserved golden shower. While all this is happening, Huey gets the lowdown on the origin of the truce between Vought and the boys as the legend tells him that it all stems from an incident in the past. As for us readers, well we only get a glimpse of it for now. As the legend tells, back during the early days of the boys when they were downing superheroes left and right, a former member of the Seven named Lamplighter went after after Mallory's grandchildren, and well, that's all we hear about it at this point. Butcher goes after the G-Men. Sometime after his meeting with Homelander, Butcher meets with Rayner again. This time, the CIA director orders him and the boys to look into the circumstances behind the death of a superhero named Silver Kincaid, a member of the group called the G-Men. So Butcher and his crew get to work. They even find out that Vought is using Compound V to poorly revive their dead superheroes and in turn turn them into zombie-like creatures. In any case, Butcher crafts a plan to infiltrate the G-Men's proprietary university called G-Wiz. To do this, he sends Huey to act as a mole within their organization. Sometime later, Huey gives Butcher a call to tell him that he's planning on extending his stay within G-Wiz. Butcher tells him to keep his guard up, but he agrees with Huey's request. A bit more time passes and Butcher meets Huey to tell him that he's pulling him out of G-Wiz for his safety. At this point, Huey has discovered that even though the fledgling superhero trainees of the university seem like decent people, there's 
just something off about their values, which he attributes to G-Wiz's whole curriculum. But despite Butcher's orders, Huey continues to stay with G-Wiz until he eventually gets found out. Superhero trainees of the university almost kill him, but Butcher and the boys come to the rescue. By the end of their fight, Butcher and his crew leave a single G-Wiz member named Jamal alive and they interrogate him about how exactly the G-Men are created. And oh boy, we hope you guys are ready for this. Jamal reveals that all the backstory of the G-Men being societal outcasts is much like all the other superhero origin stories in this world, pure baloney. In truth, Jason, the head of the G-Men, kidnaps kids and trains them to become superheroes under their control. He pumps them with Confound V and brainwashes them until they become ready for the public. Jamal then suddenly gets killed when a G-Man appears through the portal right after he finishes spilling all the beans of this organization. And when Butcher and his crew check out the huge front lawn of the G-Wiz campus, they find an entire army of G-Men are waiting for them. Butcher and the boys prepare to fight off the G-Men, but Vought helicopters arrive on the scene and start lighting up each and every G-Men there. In the aftermath, even Jason is killed. James Stilwell then approaches Butcher and tells him that Vought knows how to take care of its own problems. Because all in all, the controversy surrounding Silver Kincaid's death snowballed into something that can smear the company name, so Vought decided to take them all out and cut their losses. In the aftermath of the whole G-Men mission, Butcher discovers that CIA director Susan Rayner has been in touch with Silver Kincaid back when she was alive. Rayner purposely withheld this information from Butcher and the boys, which ultimately led to the events that just happened. Now Butcher doesn't take too kindly to the fact that Rayner held back this information about Silver Kincaid and inadvertently put his crew at risk. So he warns her that he's willing to go to some extreme measures if she ever tries to pull another stunt like this. Butcher goes to a party. Butcher and the boys would then keep the business running when they spy on Vought's superheroes during Herogasm, an annual debauched party. It's the perfect place for Butcher and his crew to gather more dirt on the company's assets, and that's exactly what they do. They also find out that Vic the Veep attended the party, so Butcher and the boys kidnap one of his bodyguards, a Secret Service agent named Michael Lucero, to find out what Vic's up to. Upon doing this though, the boys discover that Lucero is one of those rare Secret Service agents who isn't on Vought's payroll. Still, Butcher doesn't let this opportunity slide, so they interrogate Lucero. The Secret Service agent tells them that Vic the Veep is a moron in the most classical sense of the word. Not only can't the guy string together a single sentence on his own, but Lucero reveals that the main reason that the tragedy with the plane and Homelander happened was because Vic the Veep intervened with military operations back then. And of course, this was under Vought Americans' orders to push their superhero agenda to the US government. As you might know, it did not go well. Thousands of people died, and as you'd expect, Vought covered it all up. This bit of information is something that the boys know, and it's one of their trump cards against Homelander and the company. Going back to Lucero, he ultimately agrees to work with Butcher and his crew to be their inside man and keep an eye on Vic the Veep. Not long after that, however, Secret Service agents on Vought Americans' payroll discover that Lucero is working with the boys. A shootout ensues where Lucero and the boys end up on top. By the end of this mission, however, Lucero dies trying to stop Vic the Veep and and his corrupt Vought controlled colleagues. Butcher and his crew then help take back their fallen ally's body back. To the US. Vought makes moves. Vought American has been actively trying to snuff out Butcher and the boys at this point in the story. In one attempt to assassinate them, the company sent out a group of D-list superheroes after the crew. Of course, these randos end up getting body bagged. However, a bit of time passes and one of the boys, the female, gets attacked by a superhero named Stormfront. She gets hospitalized after this and Butcher is able to suss out that someone is actively trying to kill them. Mother's Milk notices that there's something strange about the hospital that they're in. Ultimately, they figure out that this was no ordinary medical facility. It's also a trap. Butcher and the boys then take the unconscious female as they try to escape. Before they can leave the hospital, however, Stormfront and his superhero team Payback burst through its walls and start attacking Butcher and the crew. A grueling fight ensues between Payback and the boys, so much so that even the goodest boy Terror has to intervene to help his friends win against these superheroes. In fact, one of the Payback's members, Crimson Countess, even manages to hit Terror when he bites her arm. Well, that was a bad idea because seeing that this just made Butcher absolutely livid. With the rest of the payback out of commission, Butcher orders Huey and the rest of the boys to get out of the hospital. Afterwards, he absolutely choked out Crimson Countess with his belt for laying a hand on Terror. And man oh man, they really shouldn't have gotten Terror involved in all of this because Crimson Countess was just the beginning. Right after getting rid of her, Butcher started to systematically take out each and every remaining member of Payback. First, he blinds Stormfront by flinging shards of glass 
right in his eyes. This causes Stormfront to retreat. Then, Butcher brutally murders the insectoid superhero Swato with a pickaxe. After that, he sets his attention on Mindroid and kills him with a shovel. Finally, Butcher gets to the last remaining member of Payback's Soldier Boy, but instead of killing the guy, he takes him as a hostage. Later, Butcher and the boys decide to finish the job and end Payback for good, especially after they find out, well, let's just say Stormfront's political ideologies. So they head to Payback's hideout where Stormfront arrives. A huge fight breaks out and Stormfront almost gets the better of Butcher, but MM, Frenchie, and even Love Sausage arrive just in the nick of time to rescue him and ultimately put an end to Stormfront. In the aftermath, the female wakes up from her coma, and as for Soldier Boy, well, we find out that Butcher had him tucked away in secret as the Englishman prepares to torture Soldier Boy to get information on who put a hit on him and the boys. Sometime later, news comes out that Soldier Boy has passed away. It's pretty obvious that Butcher was the one responsible for it, but the world's mainstream media doesn't have a clue. In any case, Butcher was able to successfully squeeze the information out of Soldier Boy. He knows that the guy who sent Payback to kill them was Vought American's president of superhero development, James Stilwell. However, Butcher still doesn't know his name at this point, even if they've met a couple times in the past. To make matters worse for their entire operation, Butcher also accidentally discovers that Huey's dating Annie January, aka Starlight. Butcher's Suspicions Butcher consults with the legend after finding out about Huey's romantic involvement with Starlight. He had his suspicions that Huey might actually be a mole working for Vought and the Seven, but Butcher and the legend can't say for sure. So the leader of the boys come up with a plan of a sort of test for Huey's loyalty by sending him to keep an eye on another superhero team called Super Duper. Now Super Duper's members are perhaps the only other superheroes in this world besides Starlight who are actually decent people. However, the legend found out that Vought is making moves to revamp the team and turn it into a gritty collective by adding a superhero named Mal Chemical to their roster. With that, Butcher sends Huey to stake out the group and we also discover that he's started to keep tabs on his crewmate, especially when Huey and Starlight meet at the airport to see him off. Meanwhile, in the wider world of Vought, we find out that James Stilwell and his new right-hand woman Jess Bradley have gotten their hands on a bunch of incriminating photos that Butcher and the boys sent to Homelander. This might not seem all too important right now, but believe us when we tell you that these photos will play a huge part in Butcher and Homelander's story down the line. But back to Butcher and the boys. At this point, even the rest of the crew is starting to unravel when MM starts to question why Butcher lied to Huey about Super Duper, telling him that this superhero team was a big player in Vought, even though they're not. Now Butcher is keeping an eye on Huey while all this is happening, and he's not too pleased when Huey blows his cover and decides to help Super Duper when one of their members choked on an ice cream cup. A bit of time passes, and Butcher comes up with a plan that will ultimately prove Huey is not the mole working for Vought, and that's to get him to fight Mal Chemical. The logic behind it is that if Huey was truly working for Vought, the company would have definitely ordered Mal Chemical and the other superheroes not to lay a hand on him. And almost at the same time, MM gives Butcher a call to tell him that Huey's legit, their boy isn't working for Vought, but it's too late because a series of events within Super Duper ends up with Huey having to square off with Mal Chemical anyway. Mal Chemical almost kills Huey, but Butcher arrives to defeat the superhero. He also tries to kill Super Duper members, but a near unconscious Huey convinces Butcher to leave them alone. In the aftermath of this particular mission, Huey's left hospitalized, and MM confronts Butcher about almost getting their friend killed due to his unfound suspicions. In the end, however, Butcher and MM make up, and he declares that maybe they can use Starlight to bring down the Seven and Vought. Sometime later, a now fully recovered Huey and Butcher prepare to stake out a Vought-sponsored religious event. They get to talking, and Butcher asks why Huey decided to confront Mal Chemical. Huey tells him that Super Duper's members don't deserve to be treated the way Mal Chemical did to them, but Butcher's not convinced. He reminds Huey that no matter how good a superhero might seem, they're still superheroes. In any case, Butcher and Huey make up. Later that day, MM asks Butcher if he's apologized to Huey for lying to him about Super Duper and thinking that he's a traitor to the crew. Butcher says he's not planning on doing that since it would mean revealing his hand, that he knows Huey's dating Starlight. Because remember, Butcher's planning on using Huey's relationship with her against Vought. When MM asks him what he'd do if Huey figures out this plan, Butcher simply brushes off the topic and tells him he'll make it up to Huey somehow. Not long after that, Butcher would meet with Huey after freshly discovering that Starlight is indeed a superhero and learning what she had to do to be part of the team. The leader of the boys sort of reassures Huey that he can tell him anything. Now guys, this particular point in the story just shows how dubious Billy Butcher can really get. On one hand, we see him as someone who's genuinely concerned for Huey, but let's not forget, he has plans in place to use his relationship with Starlight to further his mission, his goals. Well, regardless of what you think, Huey ends up telling Butcher about his relationship with Starlight.
Right. Butcher feigns ignorance and pretends to sympathize with his friend. We find out that he's made certain plans to allow himself and Huey to have the office all to themselves. And when they get there, Butcher reveals that the reason that they're able to grab footage from inside the Seven's offices at the Vaught building is because the superhero Queen Maeve is their mole. After that, Butcher finesses Huey into watching surveillance footage showing Starlight's first day in the Seven. We won't get into the details of what happened in the video, but all you should know is that Huey's absolutely devastated when he sees Starlight doing things to Homelander and a couple other members of the Seven in it. And just to ensure that he has Huey wrapped around his fingers, Butcher fans the flame and tells him that Starlight has been using Huey all along. That she's laughing behind his back and she never loved him. Huey asks him what he should do, to which Butcher simply says he should do whatever he wants. Well, Billy's a master manipulator if nothing else, but he's not perfect because this whole chain of events ultimately led to Huey taking a sabbatical from the boys and only nearly breaking up with Starlight. The Truce Sometime later, we find Butcher and the rest of the boys inside their office as they try to figure out how they can defeat the Seven. They conclude that Homelander, Queen Maeve, and Black Noir are the only three members on the team that are legit threats. Now, if you're wondering why Butcher has suddenly upped their efforts to stop the Seven at this point, well, it's because they recently found out that Homelander's planning on mounting a superhero coup against the US government. You should also know that Homelander has become increasingly unhinged at this point in the story. To add to their problems, Butcher finds out that Susan Rayner is going to step down from being the CIA's director, and she's going to be replaced by a simpering agent named Kessler. Now, Kessler hates Butcher's guts, so he proceeds to torture him and the boys with paperwork. He even threatens that he's going to cut their funding. Now, hindered with busy work, Butcher comes up with a plan to bring Kessler down a peg by going to Washington, D.C. And on his way there, Butcher starts to reminisce about the early days of the boys, and it's here that we finally get the true story behind the truce between them and Vought. In the past, we find Mallory and Butcher inside their office, trying to come up with a plan on how they can put a leash on Vought and the Seven. At this point in time, they've already got photos of what Vought did during the plane attacks and Homelander's incriminating pictures. But there's a problem with this plan. It's revealed that they didn't take these photos themselves. Someone they don't know sent it to them. Regardless, Butcher convinces Mallory to make Vought and the Seven think that they truly were the ones who procured all that dirt. You should also know at this point that the Seven had no idea who the boys were. So Butcher comes up with a plan to meet with Homelander and the Seven to threaten them with the incriminating photos and the details about the plane attacks. It works to some degree, but Butcher failed to take into account that one of the members of the superhero team, Lamplighter, was a wild card. After meeting with the Seven, Lamplighter decided to go rogue, which ended with him killing Mallory's grandkids. Mallory blames Butcher for her grandkids' deaths, and the two got into an argument about having what it took to lead the boys and to destroy Vought and the Seven for good. Not long after that, Butcher and Mallory secretly met with Queen Maeve, who revealed the details about how Lamplighter basically screwed the Seven over by going off the rails and killing Mallory's family. Plus, Butcher also found out that one of the reasons Maeve was working for them as a spy was because she was trying to atone for what happened during the plane attacks. Not long after that, Homelander set up a meeting with Butcher and the boys so that he can give Vought answers to their threats. The CIA also tried sending over a bunch of operatives as backup, but Homelander eliminated them all. During the second meeting, Homelander told them that Vought had instructed him and the Seven to broker a truce between them and the boys in exchange for not leaking evidence about the plane attacks and Homelander's horrid photos. Vought American would halt its attempts at trying to become US's primary defense contractor. As a sign of goodwill, Vought and the rest of the Seven offered up Lamplighter to Mallory and the boys. Butcher wasn't too happy that all his plans at this point only led to a truce. After all, his whole goal was to kill Homelander for what he did to Becky. Regardless, the boys accepted the offer and Mallory executed Lamplighter. Afterwards, however, Mallory's relationship with Butcher fully soured when he announced his retirement from the boys. This made Butcher furious considering that Mallory had initially promised him that he would get his revenge on Homelander. Not long after that, the boys went on hiatus. Butcher makes preparations. Back in the present, Butcher and Terror arrive in Washington, D.C., and he successfully blackmails Kessler into dropping all the paperwork he has assigned the boys earlier. In addition to that, Butcher is able to hoodwink Kessler into providing him and his crew with bottomless funding for their operations. After that, Butcher pays Rayner a visit, and he hands her files containing a way to kill superheroes by hitting them with missiles specifically designed to hone in on anyone with permanent compound V in their system, which is pretty much 99.99% of the superhero community. Butcher tells Rayner to hand over the files to the Air Force so they can use it when Homelander springs his plan to take over the government. After that, he and Rayner start talking. She reveals that she used to be a commanding officer in Afghanistan and that she's done things that she's not proud of. By the end of their meeting, Rayner and Butcher patch things up and she invites him to sleep with her. Unbeknownst to Rayner, Butcher has been recording the conversation 
conversation this whole time because he's planning on using their affair against her should he need to. Later, Butcher would find himself investigating the death of an escort along with Huey who had just gotten back from his month-long sabbatical from the boys. According to Butcher, this new case they're working on possibly has ties to another member of the Seven, Jack from Jupiter. So they visit the high-class brothel that superheroes frequent and meet with the owner. It turns out that Doc Peculiar has an entire library containing files on their brothel's clients. Butcher checks out Jack from Jupiter's file and he surmises that Jack probably didn't kill the escort. Later that night, Butcher is surprised to find out that their surveillance feed within the Seven's base of operations has been cut. Unbeknownst to him, Queen Maeve has disposed of the security cameras they had her install in the past. The next day, Butcher tells the rest of his crew that he's going to continue working on the Jack from Jupiter case with Huey. He then tells the others to find out why their surveillance feed has gone down. Huey asks Butcher what they should do if they find out that Jack really did kill the escort and he tells them that they're going to release incriminating footage of Jack online. In addition to that, Butcher informs the team that they can kill Jack from Jupiter by lopping off his head before he can utter the second syllable of the magic word that makes him invulnerable. Butcher and Huey then head back to Doc Peculiar's brothel where they interview some of the workers. Afterward, Butcher can't help but shake the feeling that someone behind the scenes is leading him and the boys to think that Jack from Jupiter is the guy they're looking for. Later, Butcher consults with the legend about the Jack from Jupiter case and even he isn't convinced that Jack's the guy who killed the escort. But the legend has no idea who really did it, so there's no dice there. On the other hand, the legend does inform Butcher that Queen Maeve was the one who took down the security cameras inside the Seven's base. Hearing this, Butcher tells the legend to tell Maeve to put the cameras back where they were or he's going to tell Vought that she's been their spy all along. While all this is happening, the Seven find out that Jack from Jupiter's incriminating video has been leaked online. Homelander tells him that he's going on a forced leave of absence from the team and Jack thinks that Butcher was the one behind this. However, back at the boys' office, Butcher tells the rest of the crew that he wasn't the one who leaked the video. Regardless, they're now convinced that the Seven will make a move against them, so they prepare to head out and face their adversaries. In this instance, Butcher decides to leave Terra inside the office for fear that he might get caught in the crossfire. Upon getting to their building's rooftop, Butcher and the boys find the Seven waiting for them. Homelander wants to have a conversation with them, and Butcher obliges. They get to talking, and Homelander uses his super hearing as a lie detector on Butcher, so he believes the man when he tells him that he didn't leak the Jack from Jupiter video. Homelander's convinced, but Jack is having none of it. He lashes out and storms off. The meeting ends with both parties surmising that someone they don't know is trying to ignite an all-out war between their parties. The Deep even makes a night suggestion of teaming up with the boys, but Butcher refuses and they all go their separate ways. That night, Butcher and the rest of the boys have dinner. They bear witness to one of the most shocking things after they head back to their office, because upon opening their doors, Butcher and the crew find Terra lying lifeless on the floor. Butcher immediately assumes that Jack from Jupiter did it. The rest of the boys know that whoever killed Terra crossed the line, so they don't even attempt to stop Butcher from starting an all-out war with the Seven when he kills Jack. Regardless, Butcher decides that blood has to be paid with blood, so Butcher heads over to Jack's apartment and eliminates him. Butcher gets what he wants. Butcher would continue the boys' business as usual even right after Terra's death, specifically digging for more dirt on the company and their superheroes. One day, a C-list superhero team called Paralactic barged into the office for another assassination attempt under the orders of Homelander. As always, Butcher and his crew were able to dispatch the 90s Image Comics-inspired super team easily. Now, Butcher and the boys know how obvious it is that Vought wants to eliminate them, but they wonder why they sent a bunch of unknown superhumans to do the job and not heavy hitters like the Seven. Realizing this, Butcher speculates that the A-listers are being reserved for something else, something much bigger. He then mobilizes the boys to make preparations just in case crap hits the fan. Most notably, he sends Frenchie and the female to directly attack Vought's offices and steal their files. Homelander has already amassed his own army of superheroes by this point in the story, and he's ready to go to wreak havoc on Washington, D.C. There's also the issue with Vic the Veep, who has since become the president of the US after Dakota Bob's death. Later that day, Butcher asks Huey to come with him to the office's rooftop. There, he surprises his friend with A-Train, who Butcher kidnapped. Now remember guys, A-Train was the superhero who killed Huey's girlfriend right at the beginning of the series. Butcher is now serving up this piece of work to Huey. Butcher then convinces Huey to execute A-Train, and he does. After that, Butcher receives a call from Stillwell, and he finally finds out the guy's name. Stillwell tries
tries to persuade Butcher into putting a stop to hostilities while Vought internally deals with Homelander. Stillwell also informs Butcher that Frenchie and the female are in Vought custody, though they'll be safe as long as he agrees to stop attacking Vought American for the time being. Well, this just makes Butcher livid, so he tells Stillwell that if he doesn't bring back Frenchie and the female to them, he's going to personally kill Stillwell. Butcher then cuts the call short and orders MM to release everything, and we mean everything, they have on Vought. At the same time, he and Huey prepare to go to Washington to confront the rampaging superheroes. Not long after that, all the dirt they have on Vought is released to the media while Butcher and Huey arrive in front of the White House. Suffice it to say that things have gone nuclear at this point. Homelander and his cronies have taken over both the White House and the Pentagon, and if you're wondering, no, they didn't do this under Vought's command. In truth, Homelander has become so insane that he's broken away from Vought to establish a superhero utopia with non-superhumans under his heel, and they start by taking over the US government. As for Butcher, he tells Huey to wait for him in front of the White House with the military on standby. He plans on finishing Homelander right here, right there, and finally getting his revenge. So Butcher enters the Oval Office alone with nothing but a crowbar in hand. There he finds that Homelander has killed Vic the Veep. Butcher confronts Homelander about what he did to Becky, but like before, the superhero has no recollection of ever meeting his wife. And here's the big reveal. Remember those incriminating photos of Homelander that was mentioned earlier? Much like Becky, Homelander doesn't remember doing any of the things in those pictures. Ultimately, this drove Homelander into thinking that he's insane and convincing himself that there's no point in trying to pretend to be a good guy, considering he's a monster deep inside. But here's the thing, in the series' big reveal, both Butcher and Homelander find out that it was someone else who abused Becky and did all those horrible things in the photos. It's none other than Black Noir, a fellow member of the Seven. That's because Black Noir is actually a clone of Homelander who is specifically designed for one purpose, to eliminate Homelander should he need to. It was revealed that Black Noir was the one who sent the boys Homelander's incriminating photos, and to cut it short, he's been doing all this stuff to fulfill his purpose and take out Homelander permanently. Black Noir's revelation causes Homelander to become enraged, and the two superheroes clash in the Oval Office. Butcher has no choice but to retreat outside so he doesn't get caught in the crossfire. A few moments later, Butcher sees Black Noir has eliminated Homelander, and as the insane clone walks in front of the White House lawn, Butcher orders the military to open fire, which ultimately causes Black Noir to lose whatever's left of his remaining strength. Then, Butcher finally gets his revenge for Becky. Now, you might think that Billy Butcher will be satisfied at this point now that he's accomplished his goal, but there's more to this story. Butcher off the deep end. Unbeknownst to anyone but Butcher himself, he's got way bigger plans than just eliminating Homelander. And to start it off, he eliminates one of his old friends, Love Sausage, a few months after Washington, D.C. Then, he sets his eyes on the legend, and Butcher eliminates the old man too. So what's his plan here? Well, as Huey discovers, it turns out that Butcher is planning on eliminating each and every superhero on the planet. To do this, he orders tons of imperfect exploding Compound V from Russia with the hope of turning it into a biological weapon that will create a chain reaction when exposed to anyone with Compound V in their system, mainly the superheroes. Love Sausage knew about the Compound V, so he had to be taken out. Meanwhile, Butcher knew that the legend was smart enough to figure out his plans too, so he had to go. But the most heartbreaking part of this plan is when MM confronts Butcher about his final solution. MM tries to stop Butcher and they have a fight. By the end of their confrontation, Butcher has killed one of his closest friends. Not long after that, Butcher makes sure that there's going to be as little resistance as possible when he springs his plan, so he further digs his own hole and kills Frenchie and the female. Now you might be wondering why Butcher left Huey alive. After all, he's technically the weakest member of the boys. Well, the answer to that is because Butcher, for all the evil things that he's done, feels a shred of doubt for what he's done to the superheroes. And as such, he let Huey live on the off chance that he might stop Butcher from fulfilling his dark plan of eliminating all the superheroes in the world. And well, it works. In a final confrontation, on top of the Empire State Building, Huey tries to bull rush Butcher to stop him from pulling his detonator. It doesn't go so well because Huey misses the mark and nearly falls off the building. Butcher, for reasons only he knows, saves Huey from falling to his death. However, they end up crashing through the building's window and hurling themselves a couple floors down the building. And when they come to, Huey's leg has been severely injured by a metal bar, while Butcher sits on the ground with a broken neck. Butcher reveals that he pretty much drafted Huey into 
to the boys for a couple of reasons. First, Huey reminded him of Lenny, his late brother, and one of his closest friends. Second, Huey seems like the perfect counterpoint to his monstrous tendencies, someone who has the heart to stop him from fulfilling his darkest impulses. He then admits that he would have killed MM, Frenchie, and the female anyway once he set off his Compound V bomb, but he never wanted to kill them the way he did. And now, the plan's completely off given that the detonator is a few feet away from him and Butcher's unable to move. Aware that Huey has successfully stopped his plan, Butcher tells Huey to grab his phone since he can use it to find all the stash houses where he's been keeping the Compound V bombs and deactivate them. Huey asks Butcher if he did it all for Becky and he tells him that it wasn't even for Becky, it was for her memory. So yeah guys, Butcher basically did it all for love. In his parting words, Butcher reminds Huey to hold Starlight close and never let go. Eventually, police helicopters arrive above the Empire State Building. Butcher knows that he's going to get arrested if the cops catch him, so he asks Huey to kill him. Huey refuses and tells Butcher that he deserves to live life behind bars. But even in his dying moments, Butcher remains as crafty as ever. He goads Huey into killing him by telling his old friend that he murdered his parents. Huey believes this, so he stabs Butcher in the heart. And with that, the leader of the boys dies with a smile on his face, knowing that his own deepest, darkest desires didn't come to fruition.